You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hi guys, it's good to be back with you again for another episode of Mighty Blue and the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. This is episode number 358 and we've got another one of those, I don't know what the word is, one of those indomitable, fearless young women who hit the trail on their terms and live their best life out there. Amanda Wiley is a young woman from Queens, New York, who's had a few difficulties in her life and wanted to face up to them out on the trail. She also had a very special reason for visiting and climbing all of the fire towers on the AT. She's got some great insights, so I'm sure you're going to enjoy hearing from her in a moment. After Amanda, yet another member of the Mighty Blue class of 2023, Carl Berquist, who has only just given me permission to publish our chat because he hadn't actually told his employer he was going on a long hike at the time he recorded. But he has now. Carl will be on after Amanda. Then our very own in-house doctor, Dr. Lynn, will continue the freezing your ass off theme by talking about frostbite. Lynn will be on right after Carl. Finally, George Stefanos reaches Pine Furnace State Park, the home of the infamous Half Gallon Challenge. To quote George, The whole concept is contemptibly childish, and I can only imagine the sort of immature imbecile who would take part in this silly farce. Of course, it took part. So let's get going, because this is going to be quite a long show. Here's Amanda Wiley, or Two Braids. So our guest today is a southbounder, which is unusual for us on this show. And she finished a hike just before Christmas. This is Amanda Wiley, or Two Braids. Hey, Amanda, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hello, thanks for having me. And I just have to correct you right away. I am a flip-flopper. Oh, <laughs> Why is it in my hang on, in my notes? Hey, not only is it in my mind you're a southbounder, but in my notes you're a southbounder. It also screws up one of my questions. But let's oh, not worry okay. about that. In we'll, my heart, we'll come to that. In my heart, I'm a southbounder right, okay. too. Okay. <laughs> and as I say, you finished the AT just before Christmas, and we're recording now on January the fourteenth. Yes. Um, how are you feeling? Well, um, it's been a challenge being back for so many reasons. Um, right now, I feel a lot better than I did at the end of the trail because I had an injury. Um, But it turns out the injury was a lot worse than we thought. And now I'm on crutches. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So what happened? What happened? So for a couple of weeks in December and November, I was feeling a tightness in my leg and my hip. And, you know, one of the last weeks, So I guess it was uh, right after Thanksgiving. It was like a rainy week and I don't know, you're slipping and sliding, but it wasn't Mm -hmm. that serious until it was. Uh, I took a one step that I lost my balance a little bit. I caught my balance with one of my legs and I was like, okay, this is like a real problem now. Um, Wow. So it resulted in a strained quad and a stress fracture in my hip. So, oh my gosh, yeah. in your hip, in my hip, in your hip, not even in. Li- oh my gosh, that yeah. that's pretty. Pa- you you must really have rested yourself pretty quickly then. Uh, you know, in, ter- in, in terms of you say it, it was actually your leg that stopped you falling. Yeah, yeah, it was my leg that that I caught my balance with. Um, wow, wow. So, yeah. but so physically, you're not feeling so great. <laughs> physically, and, and, ugh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but, but because it's only about a month, less than a month, in fact, before you, since you finished, have your feelings about the trip changed much since you finished? Because I know it's such an evolving process. I think I've only just worked out what my 2014 hype were, meant to me. I haven't <laughs> even worked out my 2019 yet. So how do you, you know, have things changed since you finished in your mind? Um, I think throughout the trail, there were so many phases of my mentality. So I think the mental side of everything is ever changing. And yes, my mind has for sure changed since the trail has ended, but all that with 
saying, of course, I'm so proud of the accomplishment, but definitely adjusting to being back to this life of being in the city. I'm a city girl. I'm in New York. I'm in Queens. And it's, of course, very, very different. So that's been challenging. You're just passing that three-week time period. I always say on the show, tell your stories to your friends for about three weeks because mm-hmm. after that they'll have no idea what you're bloody well talking about. I mean, how, how are people looking at you? Are they, are they interested in your stories still or are they starting to glaze over a bit now? Um, respectfully to everybody I know, I don't think people care that much about my stories. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody is very invested in whatever they're doing, which is totally fine. Um, (laughs) But uh, yeah, that's why I'm so excited, actually, that you asked me to come on to this podcast. So hopefully I can share some stories that might be relatable. I think there's a huge difference in life, of course, being in the woods and being in the city. So there's some things that people are just not even going to be able to fathom. Like the questions I'm getting are really from people who don't hike. So they're like, did you see an animal or did you, uh, did you take a gun? Yeah. Did you bring a gun? Honestly, people Mm. ask are asking these kinds of things, but it's just because they're not, um, connected to this, uh, uh, hobby or whatever. So I understand that. And were you, were you, were you, um, connected to the hobby? Have you been a hiker for long? No, no, actually prior to doing the AT, I had only hiked like maybe 10 hikes in my life. All right. Okay. Any long distance ones? Any long distance ones? (laughs) I think, okay. There, there was an accidental 26 mile. (laughs) (laughs) You can't beat an accidental 26 mile. Uh, That was actually a little date. Like I was going on a, a, little date with somebody I knew for a long time. So, uh, you know, I felt safe going into the woods with them, but we were supposed to do a seven mile loop in bear mountain, which is the closest hiking mountain to me. And, uh, we got lost. We got lost. We didn't follow the blazes. We knew nothing. We knew nothing about hiking really. So we didn't understand like anything that there were blazes to follow, that there were, what to bring. Like, I don't know. So (laughs) we wound up on the side of the road. You know what? It's it's kind of, it's kind of frightening that, you know, this, they, 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 I don't know, they're three, four, th- 5,000 through hikers a year try to do this. And yet there's millions of people going the Appalachian Trail every year. A lot of people go on there and have no idea what they're doing, don't they? You know, and, oh, and it's 100%. one of those things that you, you don't re- realize how t- tough it can be until you actually do it day after day after day. Did you get lost on the trail, by the way? Um, actually, that was one of my goals was to follow this tra- this trail strictly because I did not want to get lost. So I was definitely mm-hmm. what people were calling a purist, all these funny oh, terms right. that like, I'm just learning about on the trail. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, one of my big goals for myself personally was not to get lost. And I didn't, I, the only time I, you know, went the wrong way, I think maybe three times total. And the worst was only a mile out of the way. So yeah. I am proud of that it's for a, sure. <laughs> it's horrible though, isn't it? You know, you walk 2,200 miles and yet you feel terrible having gone a mile out of the way. I know. I'm like, oh. It, it, it annoyed the heck out of me. It really did. Oh, and, my God. Um, and, and, I, and being a purist, of course, you naturally wanted to go Nobo. Everybody says I shouldn't say that, but I, <laughs> I think it's the only, the only way to go. But you you didn't go Nobo. Um, what you actually know, changed your mind? Well, a bunch of stuff happened. So uh, truth be told, I really didn't hear about this trail or this concept of through hiking until like 2019 or 2020, 2021. Uh, so yeah, somewhere in those 2020, 2021 years, I, is when I really heard about this. So I didn't have this concept in my head of going North, going South. I was kind of like, how do I get on the trail and what is the map? You know, like, what am I supposed to do in that sense? So I was planning to do March. I was planning to do Novo. That's just what I heard of. And I thought, okay, yeah, sure. That sounds good. But then I had some previous back injuries that were flaring up and I got into a car accident and I don't know, it was just like, yeah, it was like, okay, I guess it's not happening right this second. It's not happening March. Uh, I had to do physical therapy. I had to get some cortisone shots, like really just a medical journey. Uh, I don't know. You know, once you've got your mindset going in March, by the way, when did you have the accident, the car accident? So that was like maybe 10 days or something before I was supposed to leave. Oh, my gosh. You must have been so disappointed then. So did you then not consider not going at all or did you then start re- just reshaping your plans? 
just reshaping the plan. A lot of people were in my ear uh, saying, you know, you really don't have experience. Maybe you should just wait. Maybe you should just do a section. Maybe you shouldn't do this at all. And I was like, absolutely not. I've been reading books. I've been trying to plan this for maybe a couple of months, to be honest. Uh, mm. At that point, it was like, I think I decided in February or something that I was going to do it. Um, oh, my God. I know it kind of sounds crazy. Now that it, you, you, it. you are kind of unusual in that. In that <laughs> regard. People be, some people have been waiting. Some people have been waiting forty years to do it, and you decided in February to do it in March. Yeah. yeah. So how did you work out your gear then? Did you, was that the YouTube rabbit hole, the normal sort of thing, or did you go to a local REI? I well, I tossed the idea that I was going to do something about hiking on my Instagram, and just kind of mentioned it. And just asked like a poll, like, has anybody done something big on the trail? You know what I mean? Uh, so somebody yeah, from yeah. my college reached out to me and said somebody they worked with uh, was going to be on the trail this year and they had a YouTube. So that person was Trailhead Justin on YouTube. So I did follow okay. that person's journey. And I was like, damn, I I could be there right now, but I'm lucky I'm not because actually I can see his gear set up and it's kind of sure, nice sure. to you know, see what sure. he's doing. Uh, his uh, YouTube was excellent. So I highly recommend it. If you want something that is not like highlights of the trail, it's like what actually it feels like to be on the trail and stuff like that. I, <laughs> yeah, I recommend yeah. that for sure. So that was a good start for me. I read uh, some books like the Appalachian trials. Um, All right. Yeah. And like that, that, that is a right, great one for the mindset. It really is. Oh, I think that helped me yep. tremendously for sure. Um, and January, I got this workbook at REI because I was just grabbing some pants to go skiing. Wow. And it was a workbook about the Appalachian Trail. So I was kind of taking the tests in the workbook and seeing like, do I even have any skills that have to do with this? Or is this something that is a far fetched idea? And once I could, it was able to assess myself and then take it from there. I, uh, started going to REI and I don't know any gear shops or anything like that prior to this experience. So I, <laughs> I went to REI, I watched the YouTube, I went on Reddit. I'm like, what's a good bag for someone with back pain? And again, you know, yeah. Reddit's cruel. They're like, D are you sure you should go on a hike? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, did, so when you got all your stuff, were yeah. you, were you happy with it day one or did you start making changes while you're out there? Oh, um, day one, I, you know, I knew I was making some gear choices that, or I knew all the gear choices I made, I was going to change at some point, uh, just being right. a beginner. I started with boots. I'm wearing long pants, long shirts. It's like June. Um, I have a five <sighs> a pound pack, well. a four pound hammock. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is obviously right. a newbie out here. Um, yeah, sure. But that's okay. You know, I learned really quickly as I do. And I think it had to be less than a month where I was like, okay, I know what I need now. And then I just kind of ordered the stuff I needed. I, it, honestly, I think it was like two weeks and I ordered new stuff. And then Good Lord. Uh, yeah. I returned my old stuff because it was really gently used. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, you know, you're you're um i know you're in your late 20s you turned 29 on the trail i turned 29 on trail yeah yes so turn 29 on trail so i presume you're able to do this financially because you did it obviously mm -hmm. um did you quit a job to do it i mean ha what happened what happened to get you out there in terms of the, working out the finances well for, uh financially i was stable for this um but I will say over the last like five years, I have been trying to kind of free myself from this corporate world a little bit, um, mm -hmm. you know, leaving jobs that weren't fulfilling. And I wound up doing sure, sure. like uh, uh, AmeriCorps and things like that to hopefully do something better. And my sister and I came upon a property in the area that we grew up in that was the right price. We were able to put some money into it and flip it essentially renovate and flip it so wow flipping in flipping in new york it's a good it's, it's gonna be a yeah. good gig and if you can work it out yeah um we were very very fortunate um we finished our renovation right before covid so we were in that one place that was completely clean and completely free of any germs for you know a couple of years before we 
determined this is not really the place for us and we should sure. we should sell this. Um, but we were very fortunate. So you were, so you were homeless? So you were homeless? Essentially, then. yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And then for a few months, I was like, well, where would I want to live? You know, now I have some money I can play around with. And what are my dreams? What are my goals? What do I like? Where do I want to live? So I went to a few different areas of New York. I went into Manhattan. I went into upstate New York, a couple different places. And sure, sure. and and then I was like, okay, I kind of don't like any of these places for long term. Um, I did month to month sublets. And by then I had my physical therapy I was feeling good about my back and everything. So I was like, you know what? I think it's really time. So all this time I was kind of preparing and just to do something exciting and great with my life. And I love to travel. And it just came to be that the trail is what was going to fulfill this itch that I had. Okay. Well, we'll come back to whether it did fulfill that itch in a minute. (laughs) Um, um, So you can walk away from your life, which is a really interesting thing. You walk away from family, friends, relationships, and all that sort of thing. How did you feel about doing that? Or was this one thing like a lot, like it is for a lot of us? This is something that's just such – it is actually quite a selfish endeavour, isn't it? You want to do this for yourself and, and for no one else, really. Did you feel good about that? Or were you in a position to where this was just the right time for you anyway and, and there was nothing holding you back? Um, a little bit of both. Like it – this was definitely the time for me to do something long term. I I had goals, physical goals, mental goals that I had achieved uh, in the past that were X amount of time long. So art directing sure. at a summer camp that's around three months that I'm away from my family and things like that. But to be clear, my family is all adults. I'm the youngest one. So it's right, right. everyone has a life and that's cool. So we're all doing yeah. uh, we're just trying to have our lives, you know. But yeah, I did bodybuilding for about four months where I was like heavily invested in that mental and physical aspect. And then I was thinking to myself as well, what is a mental and physical challenge that is more than four months that, you know, will also give me an amazing experience, a place to be, yeah, perfect. a view to see, you know, yeah. I might've lost your question there. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it, it was how you, how you how you leave your life and how you cho- make those choices to leave your life. And because one of some of my, my notes are very jumbled often when I do mm. these things. I'm, when I was talking to you the other day, you talked about bad relationships and experiences in your life yeah. and that you wanted to reclaim the space. Oh yeah. What was the space you wanted to reclaim? Really the space within myself um, to go back to places where I had experiences that were not so great, like emotional abuse or like, verbal assault really and things that had just happened to me that happened to be along the trail I knew I was going to pass by a bunch of places that I had already been to with people that didn't make me feel so good and so I'm on this personal journey of finding safety within myself so what better way to do that than hop on this trail that's going to cross paths with places I've been already and face your your demons yeah I gotta confront these things so that I can um you know, almost, it was like proving things to myself, you know, sure. um, but Good it wasn't, you. thank you, know, you. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, you know, it, some people don't face up to shit, do they? And, and yeah. because they don't, and because they don't, it's all still there, isn't it? So I'm glad for you that you did that anyway. Um, yeah. So, so now you've told me, which you must have told me the other day, now you tell me you, you're not a soboer, you're actually a flip yeah, flopper. Where did you, where did you actually start from? Tell us about that then. So I started from the closest place in uh, on the trail to my home. So my home's in Queens right. or, you know, my hometown at this point. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, I'm in Queens, New York. And the closest place to start was Stormville, New York. And everyone who I had said this to even on the trail was like, Stormville, I don't even remember that place. Yeah. And then I tell them I? that pizza place, that pizza place where you can camp behind. Oh, I know that place. That's uh, right. Stormville. Stormville, right before Pauling, oh. if you're going north. So that's where right, I began. Right, okay. And I right. do want to mention for sure that um, for me, it really wasn't a challenge to leave anything behind. I think a lot of people on the trail were uh, giving up something or like uh, leaving life behind, as you said, and escaping perhaps. But I really think the difference 
um, in my hike. And maybe there were other people out there that were having a similar experience to me. But I think what the difference was, was that I was ready to confront a lot of things and not really run away from them. But I did notice a lot of people were um, having an escapist idea, which is fine, obviously. Um, but that just wasn't sure, the path sure. I was on. And in mm. my life, I've spent a lot of time away from home, you know, even as a kid going to like sleep away camp and things like that for eight weeks at a time or nine weeks at a time. So it wasn't really so, something I was so scared. Wasn't too to alien for, yeah. That wasn't yeah. too alien for you then. Um, and you actually met somebody out there and had a had a sort of an on trail relationship with him for a number for a number, for a number of miles, and you yeah. summited Qatar with him apparently. Yeah. But then you went your separate ways. We I mean, did, uh, yeah. So did you meet? So now now I know you started in New York, which you, I'm sure you told me before. Uh huh. And but you hiked with them for about 500 miles, including Qatar. So that yeah. was the end of their hike. Yeah. And and you were you still had about 1,700 miles to go. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So I was like a third of the way in. Um to my hike when he had completed his. And we had a really lovely time hiking together. Um, I think one of the things that brought us together was both of us were taking a personal um, a personal journey uh, working on ourselves. And and like I had mentioned before, there, there weren't so many people that were doing that that we had noticed so far on our hike uh, sure. separately. And so I think that is what ultimately attracted us to each other. So yeah, we spent around 500 miles together. And that was a beautiful experience, just kind of uh, getting to know somebody, um, especially with past relationships not being so great. This was an excellent experience, I think, for both of us in practicing falling in love and having a beautiful time with it and, and not having a bad experience. You know, relationships are just so difficult that um, we kind of were talking about, is it worth it to even go for this? Like, what are we doing here? Yeah, like, yeah. I'm about to finish my hike. You have so much more to go. And then we were like, well, why not take a chance? And ultimately, as you said, it didn't work out after we did stay together for about a month after when well, he, didn't hike, he didn't hike with you. He didn't hike with you, did he? No, but uh, it was very thankful. His family did drive me back to New York, which was very kind. Oh. So we had a nice special not time not with that entirely, too. Not entirely wasted then. Right. <laughs> oh, no. no. No, I know. I know you no. don't mean that. I can, t I, can t yeah. I can tell you don't mean that at all. And, Definitely not. And I, so, I did have alternate plans and this was unexpected. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you still have a positive spin, not spin, but a positive look at that because yeah. – I was then going to ask you which you preferred. Did you like that? You obviously you obviously liked the thing of, of hiking with somebody, especially somebody with whom you formed a particularly strong bond. Or did you prefer that thing once you were by yourself? This is really my hike now because you are definitely sharing your hike when you hike with somebody else. If you know what I mean. I do. So which which of those did you prefer? Well, um, they're both special in their own ways. I mm -hmm. definitely didn't come on at all thinking I was going to meet anybody or fall in love or any of those things. So uh, that was a complete surprise, but it was very enjoyable. Um, there were a lot of compromises to be made for both of us. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I usually do do things solo, like traveling, especially it's very difficult for me to compromise on certain things, but we seem to be on the same page about nearly everything. And we weren't like, up each other's ass for lack of better terms like we weren't like always by the way. <laughs> we weren't always hiking together you know so okay we would Not, just set yeah. like a meetup or something and that was nice because yeah. it challenged me as a newer hiker to do more miles and i sure, think for sure. him it might have challenged him to slow down a little bit and enjoy the end of his hike exactly and they are challenging miles you you basically 500 miles for the end is probably nearly into New Hampshire. So Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, <laughs> they are tough diamonds. Yeah. And, and you told me, and you mentioned about you, you've traveled solo a lot, of, a lot of your life and so on. Um, mm -hmm. Had you been nervous at all about being a solo woman on the trail or because you did talk to me about some experiences with mm -hmm. other hikers that w weren't always positive? Yeah, there were, Oh well, there's a lot to this question because I really wasn't nervous. Um, a lot of people asked me that before I went, are you going with somebody? Who are you going with? Oh my God, sure. you're going with a group, right? And I'm like, no. And then if it was people who were a little distant from me, I was like, yeah, I am going with it. Like, what do you care? You know what I'm saying? Sure, there'll sure, be people. Sure, sure. But mostly I I said, there's going to be people on the trail. This is like one of the most popular trails in the world. 
and there's going to be people the whole time. Um, so I wasn't that nervous, especially going north. There were people all the time. There were some, most people were great. Sometimes there were people who you kind of had to stay firm with to make sure that they weren't getting out of line with you. But there were so many people that typically it was a non-issue, especially socially. And then when I started going south, it was a big culture shock to me. Um, That was my second big culture shock. So my first one was getting into the woods to begin with. And then the second one was, starting to go south. And I was like, oh my God, there is nobody around. There is no one around. Um, So I wasn't really scared. And I would always tell myself, even if I was scared, like you're scared, but you're prepared. Nothing is really going to be wrong that you can't handle. You have all the things you need. Your mind is in the right place and you're always going to know what to do in the right time when something arises. So that was something mantra wise that I would tell myself and sure, remind myself sure. when I was alone. Did you have to move on, move on from shelter sometimes then when, when men were, un, because yeah. I know it happens and yeah. you know what, well, I tell you what was, and, and I, I've been looking forward to this conversation because I wrote something down, which made me cringe a bit when you said it, you said that, and I'm sure this is true. And I, I perhaps I'm not being naive. I don't even think about it because I don't have to. You said that, you said that, what happened out there is a microcosm for what happens in the world. But even yeah. more, you said men think that they own your experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's horrible. As a guy, yeah. that's a terrible thing, terrible thing to hear. Yeah. Did you t- talk to us about that? Yeah. Um, in an equilibrium way, I, I say that. I, I say that from my personal experience. Um, I could have been walking on the trail and there had been men who would come up to me clearly hiking for the day or maybe a weekend who had said, you know, cause I happened to be looking for a song or something on my phone to get through the day. And they were like, that doesn't look like hiking. And I was like, what? What? <laughs> Since when? I don't not even know. Not, gr- not a great pickup line, is it really? Right. And, <laughs> and regardless, fair, yeah. don't try to pick me up. I'm hiking, <laughs> you know, buzz <laughs> off. So I'm hiking and doing my thing. And, and these are the types of interactions that sometimes would occur. So of course I, I just said to the guy, like, I mean, my legs are moving. I'm in the woods. I got my pack on and I'm making miles. So yeah, this is a hike and have a great day. Um, <laughs> FO, you know what I'm saying? Like what gives you the right to my You time? really are a girl from Queens, aren't you? <laughs> I really am. I really Excellent. am. I mean, it's just, you know, people, think because you're at a shelter that you owe them a conversation. And that's not the case. Um, It is a great thing. Of course, I love the community. Like, please don't get me wrong. I love the community. I love talking to people. But I want to tell anybody who's thinking about going on a hike, you don't owe anyone your experience. You don't owe anybody a conversation if they're making you uncomfortable. And you don't owe anybody anything. If you don't want to talk to them, don't. And if they're making you uncomfortable, you have to go with that gut. And you have to move on and keep hiking. And I have you done know, that. It it is interesting, Amanda, that you say say that. Do you think the eighteen year old Amanda would have coped as well as the twenty eight or twenty nine mm. year old Amanda? Hmm, that's a really good question. I haven't thought about eighteen year old me in a while, um, but eighteen year old me, uh, I don't know. This is this question is actually really stumping me. I think all the things. I'm saying now all the mantras I was saying to myself along the way are things I needed to hear now. And I think 18 year old me would have wanted to, to hear them too. Okay. You know, that's, that's, that's a good thing. That's a good thing as well. Now you did, you did, um, you were the recipient of some pretty special trail magic, weren't you? Now tell us oh, about that. Yes. Oh my God. The trail magic on this freaking trail was unreal. Oh my God. I mean, First of all, there were people when I was going south, I or the whole time, actually, throughout the trail, I was posting on my Instagram story. So I was doing these updates um, and I I don't know, you know, that catches the eye of some people. You know, you hashtag something. People are looking up Appalachian Trail and things like that. So sometimes there were people who were reaching out to me and saying, I want to do trail magic. And where are you? And where is there a little bubble? And, you know, asking me those kinds of questions. See, that's a thought. dangerous thing. That, that's a dangerous thing, though, isn't it? Yeah. So I would you bet know, where them, are of course. You? 
Yeah, I would yeah. vet them. Yeah. And sometimes, oftentimes, I would not actually post on my story the day of. I would post the thing I recorded the next day. Sure, sure. Just for safety. So that's a nice little tip there if anybody's doing a hike, uh, especially if you're worried about people finding you in a sure. compromising position, then definitely wait to post if you can help it. And maybe don't write the location or exact location. Uh, even yeah. if it's just by a few hours, um, it definitely changes the game for people who are not having the best intentions. But yeah, I anybody who offered trail magic, I definitely vetted a little bit, looked into their profile and things like that. But there were some amazing people, especially in Pennsylvania, like uh, this lady named Jinx. She was incredible and brought us all some much needed cheer because you know how it is in Pennsylvania. Um, but I think what, I know what you're talking about. And it is about Georgia when I was about two days away from my finish, 40 miles, 38 miles to Springer and then, you know, the approach trail. So 47 miles to the end. And I had this fall. It wasn't a fall. It was more like an intense stomping of my left leg that I I had to call for help. Like I really needed help. So I I did. I called around the numbers, the shuttles, and I, I got myself into the town called Blairsville. I limped like intensely. I mean, it took me like 20 minutes to walk to the bear line just to, to get my food off of the, oh the line gosh. that wow. morning. I was like, yeah, something is wrong. Something is so wrong. So I got off uh, Hogpen Gap and a wonderful woman picked me up and brought me to that store that's kind of on trail. Uh, I forgot what it's called right now, but you all know what I'm talking about if you've been there. Uh, I got some KT tape and I'm thinking, yeah, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Um, <laughs> but I was definitely not fine. The woman was like, you really need to go to the clinic or something. I'm going to bring you to this hotel and um, or motel rather. I get to the motel. And by the way, this woman did not take a dollar from me. She was like, please do not pay me for this. You are an injured hiker. This is the least I can do is drop you off at this motel. So I get to the motel and um, the people working there were very kind, set me up with the ice bath. They gave me crutches right away. Um, nice. They had everything I needed in that sense for that recovery. And so I woke up the next morning and I was like, wow, this is really bad. Um, I think I do need to go to the clinic. So I'm walking with crutches to the clinic, which is like a quarter mile away. Um, <laughs> and I have my umbrella and it's raining. It's starting to rain. I drop the umbrella. It's like the saddest thing. <laughs> <laughs> this man pulls over in this very nice truck and, and he was like, are you okay? Like, do you need a ride somewhere? And I looked at the guy and just made a judgment call. I was like, okay, this person is being genuine. This isn't like creepy. So I, and I'm really in need. So I said, okay, actually, I, I really do need help. And the clinic is just, uh, at this point, half of a quarter of a mile. So an eighth of a mile away. Please, it's just up the road. If you can just take me there, that'd be great. He takes me there. There's a sign on the road. I mean, on the, the door. And it says, like, look, the clinic's closed and we've moved locations. And I was like, oh, oh my God, you've got to be kidding me. <sighs> so first of all, if I had walked there and saw that sign, I would have had an absolute breakdown because already I am pausing my hike at this point to go to a clinic and I'm frustrated and I'm hurt and I'm injured and I'm sad. But this guy was just Less so than kind. 50 miles from the end as well. That's the I most mean, amazing thing. Oh my God, the things yeah. that are going through my head are like, am I going to yeah, finish? Yeah. What's going to happen? Yeah. Can I even walk? So this guy was so kind. He drove me to the clinic. I wound up needing an MRI there. He gave me his number. He said, if you ever need a ride to and from, just let me know. And that was really amazing. So uh, he even went as far as to offer for me to stay at his home because he knew the motel was going to be expensive. I, I was going to have to stay there for like a week, having to get an MRI, having to oh, wait for those results, um, get this checkup, et cetera. I was on medicine. He brought me to the, um, the CVS and just really, really helped me out, this guy. And so he said... Um, my daughter, who's your age is at my house. My wife is with me too. You're more than welcome to stay here. And I was like, wow. Um, Do you know, hang on, hang on. Isn't it sad that he has to preface that? He obviously did have to preface mm -hmm. it with that, but you know, yeah, makes you, makes you wonder in it sometimes. But it, you know. it, it did need to be prefaced though, because at this point Absolutely. I'm in an extremely Absolutely. vulnerable position and Absolutely. I wasn't creeped out by his offer, but 
I did say to him, I will let you know, because this is so generous. I really can't just say yes right now. Um, I need to sit down and think about what's going on because I'm in shock about the whole thing. So we get back to my um, motel. He drops me off there. And then later on, I get a phone call from him. I'm telling my friend about what happened. He beeps in and he said, um, you know, I was thinking about it and, and maybe you wanted to take a beat because you uh, weren't comfortable coming to my house. And I completely understand that. And Hmm. I was like, okay, this guy gets it. Cause like, yeah, <laughs> like I don't know sure, this man. Yeah, exactly, I mean, yeah. he's yeah, helped yeah. me so much, but I don't know who this person is. And if the wife and the daughter is real and you know, who knows anything really, but they were real. And he said, maybe you're not comfortable um, coming over, but uh, I, it would be an honor for me to, in his perspective, like fulfill a religious duty to, um, being a good Samaritan, that's how he described this, to support my hike and help me through this by um, footing a bill for my motel. Wow. Yeah. That's generous. That's generous. Yeah. And I was absolutely blown away by this generosity. I said, this is so generous. I I need to sleep on it because I don't think you understand what you're really offering me here. It's not, it's not cheap to stay uh-huh. here. <laughs> so yeah, I, yeah. I told him the price and he said, okay. And I just was absolutely blown away by that um, generosity. I So I slept on it. So and- you stayed there for another three weeks, ordered off the menu. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, I definitely stayed there as little as possible. Um, right, right. But, but you set was... out. You, and you, 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 you eventually you got yourself better. You know, this is yeah. So he helped you finish your hike in many ways. Yeah. It's lovely that you realize that it isn't just you. It is mm-hmm. everybody you meet out on the trail that help help oh, you yeah. finish it. And and I know that you were brought up in a single parent family because mm-hmm. your father sadly yes. passed when you were only one. Yeah. And I, and you, you tell me something really touching about what you wanted to do to honor him while you're out there. So tell oh, us yes. about that. So while I was out on my hike, um, the first fire tower I came on, what I uh, came across, excuse me, was it was in Massachusetts and I had a troubling experience in Massachusetts in my past. So being there was intense for me. And I did go back to the exact place where the incident took place of, uh, a verbal assault. And so I, you know, reclaimed that space for myself. I, I made peace with the whole thing. And then I happened upon a fire tower. So this is my first one. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I really want to get to the fire tower, maybe at sunset or sunrise. So I did both. But when I got there, I was like, oh my God, this is so special. And the reason being that my dad was a fireman. So it was sure. pr- pretty much right then and there that I decided I'm definitely going to every single fire tower on this trail. And that would be just to honor him because I know that even though I was alone, I always would talk to my dad in heaven or I would just speak out loud to him and kind of get that support from above. And a lot of things just lined up for me that didn't need to line up. And I do believe that that was some, some angelic intervention from him. And you never, you, I mean, you don't know, you never knew him, did you? Because you were only one when he passed. Yeah, sadly, no. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously you had had loads of pictures of him. So Mm -hmm. So when you're on those fire towers, how meaningful that must have been for you to be up there with your father, feeling yeah. it, was, it was with your father. So, so how many fire towers are there then? Oh my God. You know what? It's so funny. I tried not to get myself too caught up in the numbers because I do have OCD and I knew it would drive me crazy. <laughs> so the truth is I know I went to every single one because they were on the map and I made them, I made the point to get to there, but I don't know the actual number. <laughs> oh, you should check that out one day. You should definitely check that out. I will. At least 15, at least. And you also shared with me that you've been in therapy prior to hitting the trail and that you remained in therapy while you're out there. Did your therapist suggest that or did you feel that you actually needed it when you were out there? Well, thanks for asking. I, one of my main priorities prior to the trail and during the trail and just in life is to um, focus on my mental health and making sure that I'm good. Um, my cup is full before I extend myself to others. So um, because of all these traumatic experiences and I knew I was doing kind of like a self 
prescribed exposure therapy when it came to the Appalachian Trail, I knew having the support of my therapists would uh, absolutely help me maintain my mentality throughout the entire way. So um, twice a week, I would have therapy and I would kind of just uh, that, that was my main priority on the trail was so you zoomed, making sure. So you zoomed yeah. therapy. Wow. I zoomed. Yeah. In your yeah, tent? I, or, I mean, where did you do it? Where would you do it? Most of the time I would just pull over on the side of the trail, especially when I was going South, there wasn't that many people, but one time going North, I had to wake up at 3am and hike up to Franconia Ridge and I got it right after sunset. It was absolutely gorgeous solo experience. After sunset or sunrise, sorry. Sunrise, excuse oh, sunrise. me. Okay, yeah. Oh my God, it was gorgeous. And I was the only person on Franconia Ridge. Wow. Can you imagine this? Oh, yeah. And all of that because I committed to myself and my mental health journey. And I made it to, you know, a certain shelter by a certain time uh-huh. to make sure that I would have service. I double checked that on far out where might I have service and get to my session on time. So the commitment to therapy and working on myself was a hundred percent, uh, a necessity for me on this trail. How interesting. It's not something that once again, guys are so simple and they don't think about stuff like that at all. And they try to, they do tend to try to handle things on their own. Uh, and the thought of actually having therapy on trail is, is something I'd never heard of before. So, you know, why don't you? Yeah. And you never know. I mean, a lot of men use therapy too. A lot of people on the trail um, needed therapy, didn't have access. So I was very, very fortunate that um, my therapists were able to work with me while I was on this uh, experience to make it something that was beneficial. Very cool. I often ask listeners to recount their Katahdin day. Mm-hmm. And, but I rarely ask you know, the few people who finish at Springer, what their Springer day was like. So Mm -hmm. what was your Springer day like? Oh my God. My Springer day also was a community effort. I, I, it was a big practice, this whole trail for me asking for and receiving help because that's a big challenge for a lot of people, including myself. So at this point, hang hang, hang on, talk to that. I don't understand that. Okay. Because I've always asked for help because I've needed it all my life. So, so tell me, so tell me what that means to you then? So for me, I went along for a long time, figuring everything out on my own, not really asking for help because I wanted to figure things out on my own. And then often when people would offer me help, my immediate answer was just no, like, I'm good. Thank you. And then I'll figure it out. But being on the trail, I'm like, oh, these people really want to help. They're not just offering help to ask you for a favor later or, you know, I don't need to be suspicious of these trail angels or these people in the community, you know, obviously use your gut and your conscience and your ability to discern things, but I didn't need to be as like ready to say no to, to help. And also I had to understand for myself what the right time was for me to ask for help. So, so does that yeah. answer your question there? Yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it kind of does. I, but I, it's, it's something that um, it's an interesting thing to to for it to be an important thing in, mm-hmm. in, as far as I can, I can see. So tell us about that spring a day. So you you were you know you obviously you knew you were near the end. What, what was your last day like? So my last day, my last night. So the night before, a wonderful family that I met on trail. Um, they lived in Georgia, and they offered to slack pack me with this injury, which was another thing I desperately did not want to do. So that was a whole... Get over it, woman. Oh, God. (laughs) Yeah, I did. I did do it. Um, I needed the help. That's the thing. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. So yeah, I didn't want to do that, but I did. They offered to slack pack me. They did. Um, They brought me campfire. It was amazing. And food. um, And an amazing time. And then... I left my bag. They also helped me set up my tent and and break it down, which was really, really helpful with this injury. Um, I left all of my gear except for, you know, exactly what I needed to get to Springer in the contractor bag in that I usually keep to keep my stuff uh, off the rain. I put all my gear inside this bag, tied it up, left it in a bush. And then I called another friend in Georgia that I hiked with 
CW and he picked it up, uh-huh. brought it to oh the gosh. end of Springer and met me at the end of the approach trail. <laughs> oh, dude. Uh, How nice. How nice is that? Eh? Yeah. So it took so a village. It takes, it does take a village. It always does. And life takes a village. It Absolutely. really does. So, so it was over. Um, and I say you're, you're still processing it now. Mm-hmm. Do you think you'll do another one? Absolutely. Absolutely. I loved doing the through hike. My mentality had changed so many times throughout the hike, just in terms of focus. Like I thought I was going to get on there and do more camping. Like I was very into camping growing up and stuff like that. Um, sure. Not even backcountry. It was my first like backcountry experience for real. But then quickly, you know, I brought a microphone to record bird sounds. And then I realized like, okay, you're spending a lot of time at camp. You're spending at least an hour a day recording bird sounds. Like you need to focus on the hike. (laughs) So my mindset had changed a couple of times in terms of priorities uh, along the hike. And then once I dialed into like, you're not going to get to the end unless you do this, this and that, that's when I of like believed that for a hundred percent certain I was going to be finishing this hike. And that was just focusing on the hike and eating and water and stuff like that every day, which was great. I loved that. But in the beginning I would have said the hiking part, I could take it or leave it. But at the end, I really, now I like to hike. (laughs) Yeah. How about that? You know, I don't think any of us goes on this hike knowing what's going to happen to us, but it it, it changes us all in ways we never imagined. You know, I think you're very inspirational for, especially for young women, because you're, uh, um, you face up to a lot of fears and 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 while it wasn't all sunshine and roses, it was still pretty damn good, wasn't it? Oh yeah. And I, and I'm, and I'm glad you had such a good time with it and and hopefully people listen to your experience and make them realize that there's, there's nothing actually out there to be afraid of if Mm. you're confident in what you do and how you're Mm -hmm. doing it. But I appreciate you coming on the show and uh, sharing your story with us. Thank you so much. And uh, fingers crossed for PCT next year. Uh, thank Best you for everything, having me on here, and uh, hopefully you guys will see me on trail, or if not, my clothing that I've been making that are going to be more geared towards trail people in the future. Ooh. So, <laughs> well, if you've got, a if you've got any links to any of that, let me, if you've got any links to that, let me know. Okay. All right? <laughs> Take it easy. Thank you so Bye much. Then. I thought that Amanda was endlessly interesting. She made me think, especially when she referred to men, thinking that they own your experience. What an awful line. And one I'm sure that many of you ladies out there recognise, while blokes just don't need to consider that. It was jarring to hear it, but I think she expounded upon it really articulately. And the whole thing about asking for help. I think I've always been okay about that myself, but Amanda learned the importance of it on the trail, and she certainly needed it to complete a hike at the end. Now let's meet Carl Berquist, our latest member of the Mighty Blue class of 2023. Here's Carl. Well, our next member of the Mighty Blue class of 2023 is Carl Berquist. Hey, Carl, how are you? I am great. Glad to be here. Well, we've got the system up and running today, which is a good thing. Um, So the first question I'm asking most people, and and I know for for everybody, there, there is a... There's a similarity between why they want to do this, but all of us individually have in our mind what our why is. What is your why? What, why are you actually quitting a comfortable life to go out and, and be in the woods and smell regularly? So tell me about that. Well, that sounds a lot like the question my wife asked me. Um, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. So I will be retiring very shortly before I embark on the trail. Right. I've always been an outdoor person. I love the outdoors. As as I've aged, I've certainly come to realize that I really find peace for myself and and a clarity of thought, if you will, and sure. and, and deeper thought. Sure. Um when I'm out in nature. And um as I said, I spent a lot of time outdoors as as a kid and 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 even as an adult, but I haven't done any real hiking of any substance for years, but um, it's always been in the back of my mind to do. And I, as I thought about it more and as, as time was approaching to, <laughs> to my retirement, I was, became more and more infatuated with it. 
And quite honestly, in my whether I was being a complete fool for thinking I could do it, I was doing my research, and that's when I dis- got, discovered your podcast. All right, and I and I thought the uh, the there was a lot of parallels in in your first efforts to hike. This. <laughs> And I thought, well, let me listen to this. It might be informative. And it has truly been informative and, and a bit inspirational to give me confidence I could do it. Well, it's kind of you to say so. I got a funny feeling that most of us older guys listen to me talking, think, well, if that fat old bloke can do it, I can do it. <laughs> and I think he's got people out there. But you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. I don't mind that at all. So when are you actually planning to start your through hike? Uh, March 16th. There's a lot of you going in the middle of March. How interesting! So, and you know, there's going to be quite a, um, uh, quite a, um, quite a crowd at that stage. Are you okay with that? I wish that wasn't the case. Um, I, I, because part of the attraction to me is the aloneness in the woods, if you will. I like the social aspect to a certain degree, but but I don't want to be feel like I'm walking down a city street, and and I don't think it'll be that bad, but. It won't be that bad, but the, for the first few days, it will. You'll think, "Oh my gosh, this is this is so so busy," but it thins out incredibly quickly, and you can go literally three, four hours without seeing somebody, even after only about four or five weeks. So don't worry about that. You'll get plenty of time and plenty of chance to be alone as you wish. But don't you know? As as you if you listen to, as you've listened to the show, you'll know that. Nearly everybody says it's the community. So in, right. make sure you get yourself involved in that community because I think you're going to love it. It's, it's really something. And and you've uh, mentioned you've mentioned the your relative lack of hiking experience recently. But you, I know you you sent me a mail, an email before and you've you've actually done a shakedown hike. So tell us how that went. Yeah, I did a. Uh, so I went out and I'm working up in Canada right now. Uh, okay. I'm away from my family and. And I knew for me to do this hike, I needed to, I really wanted to get focus on reducing weight, going lightweight. Sure. And in doing my research, I ended up buying a considerable amount of new gear because I can't, <laughs> be, can't believe the technology difference from when I last hiked. I'm to, sure. To, I'm to sure. Now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, so I was having it delivered to my house uh, in Maryland where I live, but, but I hadn't seen any of it. So I, I went home for a long weekend to do a shakedown hike and I ran out and uh, did the Maryland section of the AT. Sorry, 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 sorry. I must interrupt you there. You went home to see your family and then you went for a shakedown hike. That's what you meant, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's, I, isn't that yeah. what I said? I, yeah, I must, similar, I, yeah. Sim- I, 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 I maybe, maybe it went quiet on me, I'm not sure. <laughs> so, uh, but as as uh, airline travel would have it, you know, I, the airline conveniently delayed my flight, delayed my flight, and I didn't oh. get in until late in the evening. And uh, so then I had this it was sort of Christmas morning. I'm unpacking all this neat stuff, but you know, I'm like looking at it and everything, and I'm sizing it and fitting it. And I had planned to go um, the next day and be on the trail by one p.m. Right. And this was uh, the end of the first week of October. Sure. And um, it was all well thought out and planned. Um, and then, of course, I got in late. I, I realized I needed to get some sleep. I went to bed. I got up the next day, was doing, putting stuff together. I still needed to run errands. The long and the short of it is I got on the trail at 3 p.m., <laughs> which, uh, and I, and my my youngest daughter had graciously driven me. It's about an hour drive out to the trail from right, where we were. Right, yeah. And uh, I said, well, okay, to, to do what I wanted to, to to today, I got, it's probably going to get dark around seven. So I probably got three good hours, three and a half hours. I didn't want to set up my tent for the first time ever in the dark. Ooh. And um, I remember you saying that on one of your podcasts. It's no good. So, I, <laughs> so I did watch the video of how to set it up uh, probably 30 times just in case. Yes, that's and, right. Yeah, and you need to. You you need to be very familiar with it that first time. And so, uh, just before I pushed off on the trail, my daughter took out her phone and said, "Dad, just to be clear, it's going to get dark at six fifteen, not seven o'clock." Oh god! And, and so I, uh, so I had even less time. But yeah. but the hike went really well. It's the first time I've hiked with uh, using 
trekking poles. Oh, really? And you done that? Not done that before? How interesting! Yeah, I hadn't done any serious hiking. You know, backpacking. I did done a lot of day hikes and everything, sure. but I've never taken any real equipment with me other than water and snacks and sure. such. Wow. And as a kid, I grew up in Massachusetts and I used to cross country ski. And so polling as you as you cross country ski is a very important element of, of your of your form and your stride. Course, yeah. Well, putting those trekking poles in my hand, I can't believe how much it made it me more efficient. Yeah, I, I totally agree. A lot of people don't, and I, I just don't do not know how they do it without. I I honestly was on the fence whether or not to get any, and I thought, well, you, it was on what your show. I think was what convinced me. I've had back surgery, and through playing sport and everything, I, I have one knee that's a bit of a bother sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so one of your guests, or maybe it was one of the gear shows, but somebody was saying it really takes the pressure off your knees. It helps to relieve the pressure on your knees, mm -hmm. not to mention about helping with balance and everything else. Sure. Sure. Oh, definitely. No, no question about it. It, it, it makes a massive difference, Carl. It really does. And my, my back, while very healthy for most of my life since surgery, um, when I tweak it, it's usually because I'm slightly off balance or an inadvertent turn with weight. And so now I know I'm going to be carrying a pack. And I sure. thought, well, if I can just minimize that by having the poles to give me some, you know, counterbalance to counterweight to, to help me, that's would eliminate a big risk to me. So, so I got the poles and I love them. That's great. I, you know, I th I'm, I'm glad you feel that way because I, I think you'll find particularly on the, there's one particular downhill and you'll remember it when it happens, by the way, going into, oh my gosh, I've forgotten what it's called now. Um, oh, it's going to drive me crazy now. Uh, it's somewhere that is, and people will be shouting out because they know exactly one, what it is. I've, me I've mentioned it many more, many times before. I'll come back to it. Um, but there's a real downhill um, coming into, oh my gosh, where is it? Don't matter. Don't worry about that. But you'll you'll know when you get there because you'll start going downhill and go downhill even steeper. But you know, but you don't need to worry about it. Was that early in the trail that you're talking no, about? No, no. Was I, it I, the I, one up in the white set you're talking? No, about? it's not. No, no. It's it's halfway through. It's nearly halfway through. But we'll talk about it another really? time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I know. I, once I do my commentary on this, I'll say what it was. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so so have you thought about because you know. You, you're a married man, you've got family, and you're leaving home for six months. Have you thought about that and how it impacts you mentally? Or are you quite comfortable that when you have those bad days, this is a six months you're going to take this time out for yourself and you're looking forward to that part of it? Yeah, I've thought about that a lot. I mean, I'm a, uh, I'm a, I'm a very proud father of four kids, grown kids, the my oldest is uh, up in Boston, and the other three actually were triplets. Well, I shouldn't say were; they still are. <laughs> <laughs> you don't become and, an untriplet. <laughs> and uh, they've just recently graduated college. Two of them graduated last year. One's going on to get his master's. The other one was in a five-year program, so they will graduate this year wow. in the spring. So off the payroll, off the payroll. Happy days. Off the payroll for sure. <laughs> so I'm very proud of them. And uh, two of my known, one of the reasons I'm starting in March is I'm definitely getting off the trail for a couple of days to go to two graduations. Wonderful. Um, How wonderful. Yeah. And, and both of them are within reason of the trail. One, one son goes to James Madison University, which is right in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Nice. So nice. I should be within... I'd like to think I'm going to be within an hour's drive one way or the other, but yeah. I, I, I've, I've the best, the best laid plans of mice and men. Yeah. 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 I got to say, don't forget, you've got a triple shower when you go there. Just, just bear yeah. that in mind. <laughs> now in terms of uh, equipment and so on, um, you said you've got all new gear and so on. What have you got? Are you tenting or are you, are you going to, um, you're going to hammock? One of the things of, uh, it was kind of interesting. One of the things of, uh, by deciding on trekking poles, I could go to the ultralight tent where the trek poles are your fence. Sure, absolutely. So I have, I got a Gossamer, Gossamer gear, uh -huh. the one. You're making me worry that I should have gotten the two because I've heard you, 
we talk about that. But I tell it, you, it, you need to feel like you're in a hotel. You need to have a yeah. bit of space around. I'm a big guy. I don't know how tall you are, but I'm a big guy. And so I needed that space around me. So having the, the double, because when I first went, it was a single. Because I always yeah. thought, you know, what do I need a double for? It's only going to be me. Trust me, a double would have been great, but don't worry about it because – you know what? You'll just get used to it. You'll you'll fill the space, and you make. Sh- and one thing you learn very early on is where everything is in the dark, yeah. and it's really important to do as well. So you got the Gossman gear. What about your sleeping arrangements? You got a decent bag. So I I went with the quilt, and I have a 50, 15 degree quilt, right? And I have an inflatable thermarest. Lovely. Um, yeah. And one of the things I did. Since my shakedown hike, hike is I decided I wanted the pillow. I needed to get an inflatable pillow. I totally agree. Totally. I just stiff neck. And, yeah, uh, yeah. I woke up, you know, it was two nights, and, and you know, it wasn't <laughs> bad, but it was constant shuffling and adjusting, and I'm like, you know, I got to – can't do this. So, Carl, this is not a luxury item. This is a necessity, <laughs> especially for us older guys. It is definitely a necessity. So enjoy it. Enjoy it when you do it. Now, in terms of um, how you're going to manage this, you're, you're um, have you, I'm sure you, like everybody else, has done the spreadsheet, but have you, are you going to get some supplies from home or are you going to really supply in town? Have you thought about how you can do that? That's probably one of my bigger concerns just because of the uncertainty of it sure. um i've so i have a bunch of stuff i've pre-ordered so i can have boxes sent so i have enough i've ordered enough so i can have like probably like four boxes sent right. and it will also give me some time to decide if going into town is viable for me it's a funny story my youngest daughter who just graduated she's going to be a nurse she she is a nurse i should Listen. say we need to change the tents now yeah but uh she's moved back home she wants to work and save a little money for a while and and the maryland area has wonderful hospitals and and critical care stuff it's right you know the, Brit, the brits right. call those brits call those boomerang kids by the way you talk yeah. about they come back <laughs> but but um so my wife who I love dearly and uh but she'd be the first to admit that you know attention to detail and things like that w- won't always be high on her list and so having the timing of the mailings I'm I'm relying on my younger daughter to be the principal <laughs> that was a somewhat that was a somewhat valid criticism by the way which is why I laughed quietly <laughs> yeah. you can see me yeah so uh, oh, no. my, uh, my my younger daughter will readily she'll smile at me. We have sort of a bond with our somewhat you know uh, anal retentive OCD tendencies at certain things, <laughs> and so she's a kindred spirit in that way for me. And uh, so she said she'd help me out. And you know, it's if I like the way the the mail drops work, I'll probably just add on to that as I as I advance. And it, but I think it'll be a mix. I noticed in 2019, a number of the kids, I sound terrible then when I say that, but a number of the younger people, which everybody was younger than than me that year, a number of the younger people would order through Amazon, through their phones. They get Amazon to deliver a certain place in three days' time or two days' time, whatever it was. But just think about this, though. When you go into town, the ideal thing is to have no food left. It's a bit risky to a degree, but you ain't going to die if you go, go one day without food. So, you know, don't go, don't go into town with too much food because right. you're, you're carrying weight that you really don't need at that time because you'll probably then resupply as well. That's worth thinking about anyway. Now, I know you're looking to, forward to lots of different things on the trail. Is there one particular thing you're thinking to yourself, man, I'm really looking forward to that? I'm looking forward to many things on the trail. I, um, you know, I guess the biggest and the biggest is optimistically the Katahdin as a as a summit. As Forget a, about it, man. Forget about it. You you, you got two thousand two hundred miles to go. Don't worry about that yet. <laughs> I know that. I know that. But I, I just you know I did that shakedown hike and and yeah. um, despite my late start, I actually got like over fifteen miles in before I set up camp the first time. Wow! Night. Well done, and, and uh I met two sisters that were hiking their first time ever. One lived in Hanover, New Hampshire, 
One lived in right, which the trail goes right through, right at the Vermont, New Hampshire line. Nice. And the other one lived in Loudoun County, Virginia, at uh, a mile off the trail. And I was joking that they had must have hiked between homes all the time. And um, it turned out it was their first hike ever. Uh And um, and it had been postponed from COVID. But when I told them where I started, one of them had clearly memorized the guidebook because they were basically doing the same section. She goes, well, you couldn't have done that. That's over 15 miles today. <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure I know where I started. And I said, but but I, I, I was eager to get to where I thought I intended to go, and I had gone right past where I had planned to stop. So, <laughs> well, that's, but, you know, you recognize but, it when you go through. <laughs> but, but honestly, um, I was so excited about how I felt after that shakedown hike, how I, how I much I enjoyed it. And I, I know I got, I had beautiful weather. So I, I know I got spoiled in that regard. Yeah. But since then, I've woken up at night thinking I'm out hiking. I mean, I've just, I'm so excited that there's a certain amount of anxiety, but I'm so excited to start the hike as well. So there's an, a whole number of things I really want to experience there. All the famous views and overlooks, yes, course, yeah. but but also just going through the bowels of the trail, if you will, because I've only done section. I've done a couple of sections in different parts up in New England as a kid, and then then down here in the Mid Atlantic sure, different sections. Sure. But I'm just I'm really looking forward to it, and um, it does allow your inner inner kid to emerge as well, Carl, and, and you will you'll feel that as well. There's something about a real adventure. You, we used to read about when we were twelve and thirteen years of age. People have talked about Lord of the Rings and so on. It feels like you are on an adventure the whole time. So I'm sure you're going to enjoy that. Now, what about what are you least looking forward to? There must be some things you're thinking. Oh my God, I don't fancy that. Well, I'm not real excited. I I would I'd like very much to be able to minimize how many days I have to hike in the rain. Um, so <laughs> yeah, so well, but there's yeah. not much I can do about it. No, so, you know, no. Six months in America, you can get the full gamut of, uh, of, of weather. So, you know, don't worry yeah. about that. Yeah. And so I don't, I don't have anything. I'm really, I guess the issue of food and, and just eating my wife would certainly describe me as a picky eater. And mm-hmm. so, you go over that as well. <laughs> yeah, well, but but I'm I'm more worried about, um, you know, I, I listen to various people who talk about, you know, you lose. I fully expect I'll lose some weight, but but maintaining enough nutrition and and health to balance what I'm going to demand of my body. Carl, it's very very difficult. You're burning, but they say, and an, the average adult male. Uh, burns between six and eight thousand calories a day you cannot you haven't got the time to eat that because you're going to do the walking so you know you just have to work it out really and and just get yourself as fit as you can and in terms of um trail names you know you're going to get one have you thought of being allowing yourself to be named or do you think you've already got one well my children are especially my daughter seem uh interested in helping me determine one um <laughs> good <laughs> well, even though they're older kids, they uh, they're captivated by some of the various movies. And one was Frozen. They had a period where they would go around singing all the songs. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> and so and I'm well known in my family for not usually being cold very much. And I always chalk it up to my Scandinavian uh, blood uh-huh. and uh so they jokingly called. They thought Olaf might be fitting, which is the, which is the snowman from Frozen. <laughs> and then, when they were young, we were very much into the uh, Disney movie, the Pixar movies. All right. And there is a the movie The Incredibles, mm-hmm. and um, which became one of my favorites, ironically. Mm-hmm. And so I said, "Oh, maybe I should be Dash," but. I, I don't I don't think that would align with the speed in which I. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know I I I, re- I particularly was happy to name myself, but you know, you and remember you don't have to accept it, but one day you will suddenly be that person. So just it is surprisingly important. I suddenly became Mighty Blue because I gave myself the name after my soccer team in the UK, but you know 
most of the people who I speak to now refer to me as Mighty Blue and think of me as Mighty Blue. And I'm Steve to everybody else, but I'm on the here I appear to be Mighty Blue, which is which is fine. You know, you should allow yourself to be to be named or choose one yourself. It's entirely up to you. Now, what I would say, um, I want to keep in touch with you. So as your um as your height develops, uh, firstly, we wish you well, obviously, and you obviously I know you're going to have a great time because everybody does when they're out there. There's not one person I've ever met who's ever regretted going. So have a great time, obviously. Um, but I'd like to keep in touch and make sure we speak before you go again at least once, maybe twice, and how your preparations are going, okay? All right. Well, that sounds wonderful. Thank okay. you. Okay, man. Well, good to talk to you, and welcome to the Mighty Blue Class of 23. Thank you. Cheers, and Bye. Bye-bye. It was Port Clinton that I couldn't remember. What an idiot. <laughs> I had a total blank and I just couldn't recall it. But he's looking forward to it, isn't he? These are such exciting days as you pack and repack, you buy more stuff that you don't need, and eventually you second-guess yourself before heading out there. Eventually, though, you're at the arch, waving goodbye to someone and you're on your own. It's a sobering moment, but one I wouldn't have missed for the world. We're nearly at the end of our 2023 team, and I'm looking forward to hearing more from them in the coming nine or ten months. Two thank yous again this week. Thanks to those of you who visited and bought from our store, hrntradingpost.com. Remember, you can also reach it directly from our hikingradionetwork.com website as well. And thanks, as always, to our great donors, who really keep us afloat. Thanks this week to our monthly supporters, Emmanuel Bravaramos, Alan Troy, Jessica Diaz and Hugh Ickrith, as well as a donation from Dennis Young. Thanks, guys. We really need it, and we really appreciate your support. If you'd like to help, just click on one of the many donate buttons on our website, hikingradionetwork.com, and you'll make me very grateful indeed. Thank you. Now, Dr. Lynn. After the horrors of hypothermia last week, she turns her attention on another very topical subject in these late January days. Frostbite. Here's Lynn. So we've got Dr. Lynn back on. Hey, Lynn, how are you? I'm doing all right. I'm recovering from all the snow I've had to shovel uh, these past <laughs> couple of days in the mountains in Arizona. <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah, we've had a dump then? of about four inches, you know, every couple of nights. So, oh, dear me. but when the sun comes out, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful up here. It's amazing. I bet it. I, I remember driving back from California a couple of years ago from the John Muir Trail and I went through Arizona. It was by far the prettiest state to go through. Some of the views were just remarkable. Yeah, just yeah, really. It. It's really an amazing place to be. So at this early stage of the hiking season, we're talking about cold things. And last week, it was hypothermia. Um, this time, it's frostbite. And and it occurred to me when I was thinking about this this morning and reading what you'd written for me, are they actually related in any physiological sense? Uh, they are uh, related in the sense that your body is responding to cold that it cannot handle. Right. And frostbite is essentially mostly in your your fingertips, your toes, your nose, the appendages, your ears, whereas hypothermia has to do with your core body temperature. Hmm. And in frostbite, you're actually using your core body temperature to help fend off uh, further damage. And we can go through that down the line as we're as we're talking about it so how do you actually define it then what, what actually is frostbite in terms of what actually is happening to the body when frostbite is about to happen um because and we'll talk about the stages in a minute but what actually is it what's actually going on yep frostbite is when the water that's in your body in your cells of your skin the muscle the blood it freezes if you've ever seen a water bottle freeze, it will expand and then it will sometimes burst. Sure. And that's the exact same physics that's happening inside your body when the water inside your cells and your blood vessels and your skin freezes. It will expand and then it will rupture the cells or rupture the muscle or rupture the skin, in which case you'll see blisters. That's, oh. that's what frostbite is. It's your the body, the water in your body is freezing. 
So the water in your body is freezing. Are there any parts of your body where frostbite would be worse than others, or is it just it has the same effect on cells wherever it occurs? It has the same effect on cells wherever it is. However, if you think about it, probably the worst part to get frostbite is on your feet and toes. The next worst part is your hands. And then you worry about things like your ears, your nose, your face. And the reason that it's worse to get frostbite on your feet and on your hands is because you actually will need to use your feet to continue to walk, to make it out of uh, a dangerous situation. You'll need your hands to be able to manipulate things like zippers on a coat or uh, changing gloves to mittens or even opening a water bottle, that type of thing. If you get frostbite on your ear or on your nose, it can still damage your skin and you could potentially lose a part of your ear or your nose. But for the hiker, it's not as worrisome because you can still walk on normal feet or you can use your hands for for doing the, the things that you need to do to keep you as safe as possible. Sure. And when we and when we talked about hypothermia last week, I asked you the question which you, and you said, I'm sure this is right. You said that uh, I asked, the question I asked was, um, is there a temperature at which this starts to happen? You said it varies by different people, but but water freezing or something freezing occurs at a certain temperature. So, at what sort of temperature would water freeze within the body as opposed to water freezing anywhere else? Same temperature as it would if it were freezing outside of the body, because because your fingertips and your toes, your ears, your nose are so uh, far from your body core, they will get colder much more quickly than your core. You don't right. have to have hypothermia in order to have frostbite, right? Uh, because right. that that specific area it, it has gotten so cold that the water will start to freeze, um, right. and the water will start to freeze at thirty two degrees Fahrenheit, sure, zero sure. degrees centigrade. So that's why you can get and you can get frostbite. For instance, on one finger and not another, it just happens to be that that particular spot, the temperature was down to 32 degrees or lower. Sure. And and in the notes you sent me, you referred to three stages of frostbite. Let's go through them. And 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 I'd never heard of the first one at all. So tell me, tell us what frost nip is. (laughs) Frost nip is uh, the first warning signs that you could be getting frostbite. Your skin will be very pale. Sometimes it will turn red. It will feel actually very cold to the touch. Uh, You may feel that you're having this development of prickling or numbness in that area. But when the skin is rewarmed, it will be painful and tingling. But fortunately, there's no permanent damage at this stage. You've, You've literally nipped it in the bud. Frost nip is is the warning sign that you need to be more careful about what's happening in your surroundings, your environment, and in your body. And it is a case of literally covering up at the time, but we're going to talk about how you prevent it in a minute. Um, So that's frost nip. Then the next one was superficial frostbite. Tell us about that. Mm -hmm. The skin is now starting to form ice crystals. The surface of the skin will appear blue, sometimes purple, You'll get a feeling of stinging, burning. Burning sensation in your fingers is actually counterintuitive. You feel like it's hot, but you're actually getting colder. And you'll also develop some swelling in your fingers because this is when the ice crystals are starting to form and they're starting to enlarge. Uh, This is when blisters can occur. Blisters actually don't occur right away. They occur usually about... 24 to 36 hours after this area has been rewarmed. Oh, wow. So yeah. oh, I hadn't realized it was such a relatively long process then to, from beginning to, from, to getting it to getting blisters. That, that surprised me a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I, so, so at that stage, are you then got, do you have permanent damage at that stage or is you, are you still looking good so far? Generally, you don't have any permanent damage. The blisters are usually the worst thing that happens, and you treat those blisters just like you treat any other kind of a blister. 
Sure, um, a sure. blister is, it, and we'll do this in, in another podcast, but a blister is basically a separation of layers of skin with fluid. And that's what happens. So once you warm up and you're in a good environment, then you just treat the blister like you would any blister and it will, it will heal up without any problems. Right. So still no real problems, but you got problems there because, and because if you're in a cold environment and you can't get out of that cold environment or you can't cover yourself up enough, you still have this still problem, which will then lead you on to, I guess, that third stage, which is severe frostbite or deep frostbite. How does that manifest itself? So deep frostbite then are starting to affect the deeper layers of the skin and oftentimes the underlying muscles. Also in the, in the muscles and the skin are blood vessels, nerve endings, and all of that can be permanently damaged. And you'll feel right away that you will actually not feel cold or pain in that area. And that's because your nerve endings have been damaged. Right. Um, your joints or your muscles may not work because they don't have blood flow or nerve innervation to do the work. Uh -huh. Then these large blisters can actually form one to two days later. And the tissue, the skin underlying that can turn black and hard and actually be necrotic or dead. This is where it gets very dangerous because if it continues to uh, not be treated properly, you can wind up having an appendage amputated. Wow. Yeah. I can't, I can't tell you, this is not filling me with great joy about going going hiking earlier in the year. I've got to tell you, <laughs> even though I, I went in I went in February second time and it was fresh. Let me tell you, um, and so you've got this, so you've got to a severe frostbite, um, but obviously you want to feel you or know that you've got it, or you start being aware that you've got it. And I guess this is all about awareness, you know, make people aware of what stages they may be going through. So once you think you may have it, hopefully at the frost nip stage, what should you then do to make sure that you manage it going forward? So for the frost nip stage, one of the first things you can do is direct rewarming. If you have a an ear that you see is a little bit white or a tip of your nose is white, you can actually take, if, you're, if your hand is warm, you can actually take your hand, you can put it on your nose or on your ear and until you see that the whiteness goes away. Uh, I remember doing this when we were kids skiing. We would come down the mountain and we'd be just zooming really fast and <clears throat> the cold plus the wind would put a little bit of a white spot like on somebody's cheek and we would come down and we'd be there by the... Um, uh, the ski lift and we would see somebody who says, oh, you got a white spot on your cheek. Immediately they pull off their glove. They put their hand right on their cheek. Oh, they really? do that. And then, and then it would warm up and we'd be fine. So that frost nip is very easy to treat as long as you can see it on your face. It's pretty easy to see on your fingers. It's easy to see tougher on your feet because clearly you've got boots and socks and all of that. Sure. I remember years, I remember when I first went on the AT, I was, um, I was in the Smokies and one night it got down to seven degrees and it was like horizontal snow as well. And it was a horrendous night, one of the worst nights of my life. And I remember remember thinking at the time that my, you know, your feet felt like blocks of ice anyway, but my legs, it felt like they were freezing from the bottom up and it, I felt the cold going up my legs. As I was, obviously I was in a warm sleeping bag or warm enough, or I thought it was warm enough. Do you think that that's a possibility that, because my legs were, it felt like the cold was getting up, something like that may have been starting to happen to me or, or am I just being dramatic? <laughs> no, it's, it's very possible that something was starting up and uh, your body fortunately was able to take care of it. Funnily enough, you know what you know what happened? I got up, and went from being in the middle of the night, out of the shelter. I mean, you meant to go a hundred yards away. There was no way I was going to do that. I was hanging onto the side of the shelter um, with this horizontal snow. But the mere fact of getting out of my sleeping bag and walking, and getting back in, made me feel so much better straight away. So that just that little bit of movement really helped me. So, how do you prevent it happening in the first place? Is it just a case of cutting off the exposure points and making sure those exposure points are protected? Uh, that's one part. Yes, absolutely. Get out of the cold, protect your skin, get out of the wind. Wind actually 
we all hear about the wind chill factor. Wind is a big factor in uh, a frostbite. Warm your, your hands. If, if your hands are frostbitten, you can warm them underneath your arms, you know, use your armpit or sure. on your abdomen, because that's where the, the, the core temperature is. Uh, warm your ears, nose, face with your hands, but be careful. Don't rub because your skin is very delicate at this point, and you could actually worsen the tissue damage if you rub it. Just put it on, just put your hand on your face or put your hands under your arms. Don't rub, very important. If you have any wet clothing and you can take that off and you can substitute it for dry clothing, that's really important. Sure, sure. What you just talked about, you got up in the middle of the night, movement, exercise. What's happening there is your body temperature, your core body temperature is is warm. And when you actually move, you're moving the blood, the warm blood from the core to the extremities, and that will actually improve your temperature in your hands and in your feet. So sure. what, what you experienced that night was a perfect normal physiology. Yeah, frightened yeah. life out of me, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So... That's frostbite, but before we let you go, um, I want to uh, I want you to answer a question from a listener, and he didn't leave me his email address, so I can't send him back your response. It was about how how somebody copes with medication on the trial, um, and you wrote a you, you wrote a response back to me. Um, do, do you remember the question? Yes, actually, I do, and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so this listener wanted to know how to manage long-term medications that we take every day when the doctor needs to write a new prescription or make a refill. Sure. I've actually had this. I actually was delighted a couple of years ago when a patient of mine said that he was going to start hiking the Appalachian Trail. And he said, do you know what that is? Well, <laughs> did, Funny you we, should mention that. did we have a great conversation? It was just <laughs> so much fun. So he was on a uh, daily medication. What most doctors will do, first of all, they'll be very excited about your, your trip. <laughs> so they'll be, they'll be all in. Most doctors will give you a 90 day supply of medication, uh, unless it's a, a certain type of medication where you're only allowed a 30 day supply at a time. Sure. And most people are, don't really want to carry 90 days worth of medication on the trail. Even if it's a sure. tiny little pill, it takes up room. Sure. I would recommend you, you take at least a 30-day supply on the trail and make sure you have people to send you your prescription uh, in a mail drop, if you can. Uh, another way to do it is to, if you... If you use a pharmacy that's a chain pharmacy like yeah. CVS or Walgreens or Rite sure. Aid, you can find a lot of those in the trail towns. And those pharmacies can bounce their prescription from your original pharmacy to, let's say, the CVS in Pauling, New York. All right. Okay. And so you can you can go to the CVS or you can call the CVS up you know, a couple of days ahead of time and say, listen, I need this refill. And uh, my farm, my local pharmacy is the CVS in, you know, Virginia, sure, or something like sure. that. Can you transfer the prescription? And they, they could, they usually can do that very well. That's helpful. That's yeah. helpful. Appreciate it. Yeah. I, I was going to send it to him. But I couldn't find his email anywhere. So that, I'm glad, glad we had a chance to talk about trial. So sure. we've done hypothermia and frostbite. Are we going to warm up a bit next week? I mean, what's that? What are we looking at next? <laughs> <laughs> so, I thought maybe the next thing to do might be hydration okay. because you need to stay hydrated and you need to stay well fed in order to fend off hypothermia and frostbite. Um, and both of those take a bit of time and I don't want to take up too much time on, on one podcast. So I figured I'd do hydration next okay, and then cool. maybe nutrition after that. Cool. All right, Lynn. Well, thanks for coming back on. And um, hopefully you don't get snowed in. You can get home eventually. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think yeah. the snow's done for this week. And of course, next week, uh, it's going to be 40 degrees and sunny here. But I'll be back home in Connecticut where it's going to be <laughs> raining. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll speak to you next week, okay? All right. Bye, then. Bye-bye. She is so relatable, isn't she? She made it clear enough so that even a dunderhead like me can understand what she's talking about. 
Once more, like our previous episodes with Lynn, I'm adding a notes to the Google Drive file that you can gain access to from the link in the show notes. Finally, Jules Stefanos initially disdains and then succumbs to the half-gallon challenge. As with me, it didn't end well. I'll see you next week. Chapter 13, The Furnace. Penmar County Park, Maryland, to Duncannon, Pennsylvania. Thursday, the 14th of July, 1983, continued. After observing all those rundown hovels in Maryland, I was very interested in checking out the first Pennsylvania shelter. Mackey Run Shelter was two miles north of the state line. It was also less than a tenth of a mile past the AT crossing of a major state road. Needless to say, it was hopelessly trashed out. Back in 1936, when it had been built, it probably was a good idea to build shelters right next to roads. It obviously made the logistics of the operation much easier and maintenance more convenient. Today, most of the 1930s and 1940s era shelters I've encountered lately are armpits, severely vandalised and used as party spots and dumping grounds by people who care nothing about the woods or the Appalachian Trail. Such is progress. The shelter in which I'm staying tonight, Antietam Shelter, is four trail miles north of Mackey Run, located in the heart of a large Michaud State Forest picnic grounds called Old Forge. Antietam Shelter, like Mackey Run, is very close to a road, but this shelter is in excellent condition. At least 20 tents were pitched in a large field just beyond, but the shelter itself was empty when I arrived. The waters of the nearby creek were polluted, but I was able to get water for dinner and breakfast from a drinking fountain a quarter mile up the AT in one of the picnic areas. While making this trip, I passed the large group of campers whose tents I had seen from the shelter. An older man was playing guitar and singing folk tunes. It seemed a rather solemn event. He never came close to cracking a smile, and the group was listening in an equally grim rapture. I managed to walk a short distance past them before I became helpless with laughter. Don't ask me why. I've been on the trail forever now, and strange things are happening to my mind. I hope that no one was looking, because my back was shaking so violently, it must have been obvious. I want this man to perform at my next party. It turned out to be a church group on an outing. Later, another thru-hiker who had been socialising with the group joined me at the shelter. His name was Tracy, and his trail name was The Spaceman. Having just returned from ten days off the trail, visiting friends and relatives nearby, he was having a difficult time working himself back into shape. In two and a half days from Harper's Ferry, I had covered the distance that he had walked in four days since his return. An excellent example of what too many days off will do to your hiking. I'm sure to learn a lot more about this phenomenon when I make my own layover in Connecticut. He feels that he's over the hump now and plans to begin serious hiking again tomorrow. I'm feeling pretty good myself. After two mediocre days, I finally hit my stride today, hiking 21 miles. My plan calls for a three more 20 mile plus days in a row, followed by an 11 mile half day into Duncannon. Hope the weather cools down a bit. This could be a rough stretch if the days remain this sizzling. Friday the 15th of July, 1983, mile 1054.6. Last night was the sultriest yet on this hike. At 9.30pm, I was lying atop my sleeping bag in my underwear, sweating bullets. I knew then that today would be a memorably hot one. Sure enough, it was already around 80 when I hit the trail this morning at 7.15. I passed through the remainder of the picnic grounds and began climbing Snowy Mountain. The Appalachian Trail from there to Chimney Rocks was like a New England footpath, a rocky, deeply eroded gully which leapt straight up the mountain. I dropped my backpack at the junction with the side trail to Chimney Rocks. The viewpoint looked promising, but most of the views were invisible through air that was three parts steam and two parts smoke. I returned to the AT and resumed hiking under the dreary, whitewashed sky. The AT followed the crest of the ridge for the next few miles. It was very easy walking, but my t-shirt soon became plastered to the pond, forming beneath my backpack. For the first time since Shunda, the trail attained an elevation of more than 2,000 feet near Snow Mountain Summit. I won't even see that attitude again until Connecticut. I skipped the side trail up to the actual summit and its fire tower. After Chimney Rocks, I just didn't feel the need to climb to another view of the Merc. The next few miles were mostly on a recent relocation from roads. The trail proceeded through the woods along the side of Chorus Ridge. I stopped for a few minutes at the Raccoon Run shelters in order to read the register. These shelters were an example of a phenomenon that is almost unique to Pennsylvania on the Appalachian Trail. 
Rather than build one large shelter here to accommodate eight people, they built two small shelters, each sleeping four. There are several more pairs like this up ahead on the trail in this state. My first glimpse of Caledonia State Park, about the halfway point of today's hike, resembled something from out of the twilight zone to a man who has spent most of the past two and a half months alone in the woods. The trail ran directly past a large, fenced-in public swimming pool, into which was crammed such an incredible mass of humanity that it appeared to be one single huge, screaming, laughing, splashing organism. It was as if a gateway into another universe had suddenly opened before me. Tracy, who had departed the shelter this morning almost an hour before I did, was part of this beast. He invited me to come in, but it was just too weird for me. Lately, being with ten other people in one place seems crowded. I would have been completely out of my element inside that mob. Even Tracy, who had just been off trial for a week and a half, agreed that he was feeling a strong dose of culture shock. It was 12.30 and I had hiked more than ten miles that morning, so I did brave the throng at the adjacent snack bar. The prices were ridiculous, but I bought two 20-ounce Cokes, two cheeseburgers, French fries and an ice cream sandwich. That meal cost me more than $7, but how could I look my stomach in its soft brown eyes and say no? It had put up with so much on this trip. I lugged it all over to a table beneath a huge shade tree in the nearby picnic area. I gobbled the meal and sat sipping my Coke in the shade with my boots and socks off for well over an hour. As I was putting on my backpack, an older gentleman at a nearby table asked me to come over. He and his wife asked a lot of questions about my through hike and we chatted for a few minutes. When I left, he handed me a paper bag which contained two large muffins, a cream donut and a candy bar. For some reason, he felt the need to apologise that they did not have more to give me. I was sorry too, but I had to smash that cream donut onto his face and grind it in with the heel of my hand. These people just have to learn to come prepared. But seriously, folks, I was touched by the generosity of those complete strangers. The solid food came in very handy, because my data book had shown groceries available directly adjacent to the Appalachian Trail in this park, and I had been counting on it. The only food near the AT turned out to be at that snack bar. By the time that I finally left that picnic area, it was two o'clock, and I still had almost ten more miles planned, which began with one killer of a climb back up to the ridge crest. The gentleman who had given me the food told me that the temperature today was in the mid-90s. I could have lived without that little tidbit of information. Some things you just do not need to know. I crawled up that slope, sweating like a pig. The trail levelled out for a short distance at the Quarry Gap Twin Shelters, where I stopped briefly to read the register and collect myself for the remainder of the climb. The final six or seven miles of trail was rather level hiking across a flat ridge crest, but any type of backpacking was a death march in that steam bath. Frequent stops to dry off and gulp hot, dirty air only took more out of me in the long run, but my body's cooling system was unequal to the challenge again today. My brain was starting to cook too. Less than two miles from home, I discovered I'd left my guidebook behind at the last rest stop and had to walk back a half mile on the trail to retrieve it. Tracy called up to me there and we arrived together at the Birch Run shelters a few minutes past seven o'clock. Tracy and I set up our gear in one of the twin shelters and started making our dinners. A very strange group was staying in the other shelter, a mob of teens from some local church with one adult. He must have been the chaperone, but he did little to control them. Perhaps he had fortified himself for this task with just a tad too many Valiums. I could see the need. The kids were running around screaming like young children wired up on Halloween candy. For some reason, a couple of them dropped by to borrow a shovel. I told them I'd foolishly left mine at home. They left and we started laughing. We didn't stop for hours. One chubby fellow, who seemed to be the ringleader of the group, got one of the kids all excited about taking part in a snipe hunt. The lad was supposed to go off into the woods with a cloth sack and wait while the other kids drove the snipes towards him, at which point he could simply hold the bag open as the befuddled birds just blundered inside. Of course, the snipe hunt was one of the oldest gags in the book, and that kid was going to be in those woods for a long time, waiting for snipes or anything else to show up. He wandered off all fired up in anticipation of the great adventure in which he was about to participate. When it began to grow dark, the kids got three large bonfires going in front of their shelter. Most people would have been content with one, particularly on such a sultry night as tonight, but I guess that these kids decided that this would be thrice as much fun. Maintaining three infernos kept them all hopping rest of the night. Most of the group ran around in the forest gathering wood, which the blazes were consuming as fast as they could retrieve it. 
The stalwart leader was standing by the fires, chopping the wood up with an axe and feeding the hungry flames. A few of the others were climbing all over the roof of their shelter, making strange calls and shining their lights out into the forest on some arcane mission of their own. You're not supposed to stand on the tin shelter roofs. It weakens their rainproofing qualities. The kid with the axe kept driving it into the wooden wall of the shelter to keep it handy when he was not using it. Tracy managed to gasp out between laughs that this was the most blatant case of shelter vandalism that he had ever personally witnessed. Ordinarily, witnessing such flagrant abuse of the shelter system on which through hikers such as myself depend would have made me irate. These kids were simply too stupid to hate and so over the top with their complete disregard for trail etiquette that I just couldn't stop laughing long enough to get angry. It was like watching an incredibly stupid sitcom with characters too dumb to be believed come to life. Or perhaps the Three Stooges procreated. Nyak, nyak, nyak. Mo Jr., Curly Jr. and all the other knuckleheads kept us awake well into the night. They also kept us laughing. A few of them stopped by our shelter to ask if they could stand on our roof to spot deer. I managed to gasp out a no between laughs. They walked away sulking. Around ten, Tracy and I heard boards being torn apart. I laughed and gasped. Oh shit, there goes the outhouse. Saturday, the 16th of July, 1983, mile 1075.5. I was able to drag myself out on the trail by 7 o'clock this morning. That was the closest thing to an early start I've managed in a while. The first six miles today were similar to the last few miles of yesterday's hike. The Appalachian Trail followed the long, relatively flat top of South Mountains, paralleling a gravel track which ran for miles along the ridge crest. Mounds of dirt almost as tall as a man bordered the trail at frequent intervals. They looked soft and inviting in the wearying heat, at least until I noticed the swarms of ants running in and out. I had never seen anything to compare with those enormous ant hills. They must have required countless generations of ant labour. The South Mountain area in southern Pennsylvania is by no means pristine wilderness. The AT crossed several dirt roads that ran east to west across the ridge. I also passed dim traces of several old circular hearths where wood used to be partially burned in order to create charcoal. In the late 1700s and the early 1800s, this had been a major industrial area, these forests heavily lumbered for the blast furnaces of the old charcoal iron industry. I stopped briefly at Tom's Run Shelters, just to read the register. Shelter registers have assumed a place in my life that newspapers fill in many ordinary lives. Freshly informed, I followed the AT as it descended along the banks of Tom's Run into the valley between South Mountain and a parallel ridge to the east known as Piney Mountain. Across Pennsylvania Route 233, a bustling four-lane state road and entered Pine Grove Furnace State Park. I came to the park's little grocery store at 11.30, just in time for lunch. The store is the renowned home of the Half Gallon Club. If you buy a half gallon of ice cream, finish it without puking and display the empty to the store's owner, you too can be a member. You're presented a piece of construction paper and a magic marker, with which you can create your own little sign proclaiming your achievement to the world. The owner hangs it up high on one of the walls of the place so that everybody will know what a pick you are. The whole concept is contemptibly childish and I can only imagine the sort of immature imbecile who would take part in this silly farce. I wrote a letter to home as I sat on the front porch of the store polishing off a couple of cold cokes and my half gallon of chocolate ice cream. My little victory sign read, I came, I ate, I conquered, I ralphed. Victory was not without its costs. I didn't feel well enough to resume hiking for more than an hour and it took several more hours to shake off a bloated feeling of lethargy. As I left, I told the young man who owned the store that the club was just a vicious plot to ruin through hiker's mileage. He had a very evil laugh. After this pleasant interlude, the day kind of went downhill. Temperatures continued to soar as the afternoon wore on. While still in the park, the AT passed Fuller Lake, the flooded remains of the old strip mine which once supplied ore to the old blast furnace for which this park is named. Today, the lake is a popular swimming area. For me, it was another strong dose of culture shock. The Appalachian Trail followed its sandy beach for a while past crowds of people in bathing suits. The bikinis helped me overcome my recent aversion to crowds. The remainder of the day was rather uneventful, just another long tropical trudge. Heat, steam and dust. This is where you pay your dues for a distant moment in the sun on a mountaintop high above cool October forests in northern Maine. The sometimes severe price to be paid can only sweeten that distant moment even more, knowing the hell through which you went to get there. 
I shuffled through my small stack of inspirational mental images and selected the one where I'm climbing the last few feet to the summit of an anonymous mountain in northern Maine. As I break out on top, I suddenly catch my first sight of a mountain which had thus far existed only in my dreams. I kept walking. There's no need to go into detail about the afternoon's death march. Nothing really happened. The Appalachian Trail meandered along near the crest of Piney Mountain through dense woods. I arrived at Moyer's Campground, a commercial establishment just off the AT, at 7 o'clock. I walked into the building that housed the office and the camp store and found instant oatmeal in the small grocery section. This was the most crucial of the supplies which I had been unable to purchase in Harpers Ferry. I now had enough breakfast to reach Duncannon. The girl behind the counter was gaping at me as if she was afraid I was going to drop at any moment. I asked to rent a tent site for the night and she called Mr Moyer over to take care of me. He checked me in. He offers a very nice discount rate to Appalachian Trail hikers. The only restriction that he has is that we cannot use the giant swimming pool. I didn't mind. He was also staring at me like he was afraid I was about to die on him, so I broke the ice by asking if he knew what the temperature got up to today. He replied that he had just heard on the radio that it was 104 degrees this afternoon. I told him that I believed it. Mr Moyer gave me directions to the shelves and invited me to help myself to one. That sounded like a plan. I dropped my backpack off at the tent site and headed over with my towel, camp soap and clean instead of clothes in my arms. The first contact with that cool water was one of the ten greatest moments of my entire hike. I left the hot water knob turned almost completely off. The effects of that cool shower and a cold soft drink from the store had me feeling almost human again when I emerged a half hour later. The shower building also had a coin laundry, so I threw in my small load of filthy, sweaty hiking clothes. It was past 8.30 by the time that I had made dinner, but it was worth it. The shower and the clean, dry clothes were a great reward for sticking to my planned 21-mile day despite unprecedented heat and humidity. I am becoming almost cocky lately in the face of adversity. Yep, bring on the humidity. Bring on the bad trail. Turn up the furnace. Just try to stop me. I wonder how cocky I'll feel tomorrow. I have a long day planned, almost 23 miles, including the dreaded Cumberland Valley Roadwalk, 14 miles of unshaded, treeless roads. More dues to be paid tomorrow. At 9.30pm, the temperature is still almost 90. Something interesting happened today. I have now hiked 1,075.5 miles from Springer Mountain. Mount Katahdin lies 1,063 miles ahead. I'm more than halfway home.